Well, this morning's announcements were and are a, a great segue into uh, this morning's sermon, where we are focusing on this word serve. If you've been with us over the course of the summer, we've been looking at this, we've been in a series entitled What's in a Word, as we think about these words that um, are, have transformative value throughout the New Testament, that, that inform us, that help us engage our faith. Does anybody remember off the top of their head the word that we focused on last week? Go. Somebody said that in the early service. That was two weeks ago. That was Pastor Jeff. That was good. Last week was me. Does anybody remember that? Yes, thank you. Oh, praise the Lord. Um, it was the word run. Somebody from Saturday night service said swim, which was close, but not, not quite. Um, and we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. This helped um, us get where we, where we were going with this word. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us live in faith in an obedience to Jesus Christ. We talked about this word run and how it's been modeled um, through, for us throughout history from the Old Testament saints and to those around us now who are, who are running well. And as we talked about this at the outset of, of the sermon last weekend. Um, we talked about how these transformative words, that they've been helpful as it relates to how I engage my faith. How do I participate and, and come alongside of the transformative work that God wants to do in my heart and my life? And these words have helped me, helped me understand that. Um, and, and, that's been, and that's been true. But I also sort of have recognized as I've processed this, that for me, if I, if I fail to understand the, the who or the why behind these verbs, then, then I can easily kind of corrupt the transformative value and purpose behind these and develop my own kind of sense or, or method for works-based righteousness, right? Do you ever find yourselves thinking this way so if I just if I just believe more or if I just give more or if I just run further and and faster then I will have more credentials to stack in front of my holy God as to why he should find me acceptable or at least as why he should find me more acceptable than that other guy and we can we can begin to think this way or somehow I I attempt to enter into some sort of negotiation with God where I lay out all these chips of, of my best deeds in an effort to get the, the favor and the blessing of a God who has already given me everything. It, it really is, it makes no sense at all. It, it's an entirely backwards way of thinking and yet when I'm left to my own devices, I can inevitably end up there. I was thinking about and processing this, this tendency in my own faith journey this week, in part because our word this week, this transformative verb, as we talked about, is the word serve. And I think it happens to be one word, one action, where I can be prone to neglect the transformative aspect of serving in order to, to collect spiritual merit badges to show off to my family and my friends and, and ultimately to my God. However, I would also argue on the flip side of that, that this word serve and the acts of serving has at times been the very instrument that God has used to bring about the most dramatic, the, the most life-altering works of transformation in me. There is something about serving others when I'm not... When I'm not using it for my own recognition or in some sort of spiritual self-advancement that has incredible power to change us, to change me. Because I believe that genuine acts of service is the outworking of the message of the gospel. The two are intrinsically linked. And it is ultimately then the gospel that has the power to transform. I'm reminded of this every summer as I watch our students immerse themselves in opportunities to serve as a part of our short-term mission experiences around the world. 
I've seen how intentionally engaging serving opportunities creates what I call this greenhouse effect in our faith. It creates an environment that is conducive for growth. I've seen students grow in their faith by leaps and bounds as they've intentionally engaged in serving others. It's one of the reasons why we as a church place such a high value and invest in in these trips, these experiences for our students. Because the dividends are, are enormous. The impact is significant. Many of you have been a part of that. So let's begin by, by taking a look at our memory verse this week. I hope you've had the opportunity this summer to commit uh, these verses to memory because they really are so much truth in there that God brings back into our hearts and our lives when we need them most. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 9, verse 35, and if you would, recite this with me just so we can begin the process of, of memorizing this together. It says, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And the servant of all. Today I want us to look at the context surrounding Jesus' statement about being a servant and to consider how it informs our own call to do the same. Let's pick things up now in Mark chapter 9. If you want to turn there with me, we're going to look at some of the verses that precede verse 35 here and uh, and consider what it means to serve together. Beginning in verse 30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If any one of you would be first, he must be the last of all and servant of all. And he took a child, and he put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's take a, a few moments together to unpack these verses a bit, and to consider what they teach us about what it means to serve. And and it stands out to me that as this passage begins, it begins from a place of a misunderstood purpose. A misunderstood purpose. By this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is now transitioning out of his sort of public phase of ministry, and he's beginning to seek time alone with his disciples in order to teach and to prepare them for what lies ahead, ultimately his betrayal and his execution. The text even says that he didn't want anyone to know where they were. Jesus now, in really no uncertain terms, tells his disciples that he is going to be delivered into the hands of men and killed, and that three days later that he will rise again. Jesus is preparing his disciples here for his impending suffering and death and and that which God would require of him and ultimately then what Jesus will require of his disciples from from a human perspective his plan is riding on these men who have heard him teach who have seen the miracles and now he is explaining what will unfold what it will cost to redeem his people and the passage says they did not understand the saying Even they were afraid to ask. The disciples don't know what's going on here. Is Jesus now just telling another one of his parables? And they're left to figure out what the meaning is for themselves? It's clear from the text here that the disciples don't know what to do with this statement from Jesus. And furthermore, it says that they are afraid to ask. Now, to be fair, they had some valid reasons to be a little bit cautious here. If you flip back just one chapter earlier in Mark 8, where Jesus tells his disciples for the first time that the kingdom that he is ushering in is coming through sacrifice, not, not as a political revolt. Um, this is eight, chapter 8, verse 31. 
and following, and it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The last time now that Jesus talked in this way, the last time that he made a statement about suffering, Peter did speak up. And it really didn't go that well for him. Jesus looks at him right in the eye and and essentially calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. There's no other... There's no way here now that Peter or any of the other disciples are going to challenge Jesus on this uh, statement about his soon coming death or really even to ask for further clarity. But what remains abundantly clear is that the disciples here are still operating under a false assumption with regards to what Jesus had come to do and how ultimately that he was going to accomplish that. Among those who followed Jesus, they still failed to understand his ultimate purpose. And where there is a failure to understand purpose, there are inherent risks. We live in a world in our day and age that is is surrounded by warning and caution stickers, reminding us what something's purpose is, and if you fail to use it in that way, you're likely going to get hurt. When I bought a lawnmower a few years ago, There's just pages and pages of warning labels, one of which is to include not to use the lawnmower to trim your hedges with a stick figure holding the lawnmower up like this, you know. And you know that that exists there because somebody's tried that, right, and thought, I'm going to get these hedges trimmed real quick. And uh, they didn't use it according to its purpose. On my oven, when you put the door down, there's a warning label that says don't use the door as a footstool to get things out of your cabinet above your oven because the oven will collapse on top of you and it has a stick figure laying on the floor with an oven on flattening it, right? I've even seen a chainsaw with a warning label not to grab the chainsaw by the opposite end, you know? Because if we don't understand the purpose of something, if we fail to get that, the chances, the likelihood of us being hurt or hurting someone else are immeasurably high. But think about it in the context of the church. When we, when we fail to understand purpose, then we fail to understand the mission. And when we fail to understand the mission, then we become ineffective at best and, and at worst counterproductive. We become dangerous to ourselves and, and to those who encounter us. Jesus, later on in the Gospel of Mark, would describe his own purpose by saying, For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want to pause here for a moment because I believe that this point is absolutely critical to us as the church, to us in our own call to serve, whether it's here in in this building, in this church, or in our homes, or, or in our community, or in our world. In order for us to remain effective We must be crystal clear on our purpose. We must be absolutely focused on that which Christ has left us here to do. On our call to make disciples from the book of Acts, to proclaim the gospel, to be the very continuation of that which Christ himself did when he walked in flesh and blood here on this earth. This is our unequivocal and our undeniable purpose. And it has to be at the front and center of the life of the church. This this admonition here, this call to serve, isn't an activity. This isn't one good option among many. It is the very heart of the gospel, and it has to be at the very heart in the life of the church. When we lose sight of our purpose, when, when we lose sight of our call to serve, we can be a lot of things. But we will fail to be the church. This misperceived or misunderstood purpose in this text, as we see it here in Mark 9, is further illustrated now by the disciples' argument among themselves with regards to who will be the greatest among them. This now leads Jesus into this teachable moment. A teachable moment. 
This is verse 33 through 35 of Mark 9. It says, As they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last, and a servant of all. I love, I love what Jesus does here. He pulls a page right out of like the parental playbook. It's a classic. He uses the old ask a question, but you're not really asking a question because you already know the answer, so you're just making a statement move. My mom has her black belt in this move. She can ask a question and say everything that she needs to say all at the same time. When she walked in, when we were kids, and said, does anybody know who made or where this mess came from? She wasn't curious about who made the mess. She was saying, I know exactly who made the mess, and it better be cleaned up by the next time I get in this room, or I'm going to ask a much harsher, more difficult-to-answer question. I've been well-trained in this, and I've used it in my own uh, daughter's lives. Jesus is now with his disciples, and he says, what were you guys, what were you talking about back there? Knowing all along exactly what they were talking about. This, this conversation is further evidence that that the disciples kiss, continue to have a misunderstanding of the purpose that Jesus here is operating under. His disciples are still imagining Jesus entering Jerusalem as this, as this political or this military liberator. And they're having this discussion, this argument about how they're going to be lined up behind Jesus as he proceeds into Jerusalem as the victor and their place of honor behind him, according to their own perceived merit and, and worth. And we do the same thing, don't we? I mean, we create hierarchies and status for ourselves and, and positions, and, and we do all of that to this day. And in the midst of that, Jesus now sits down with his disciples, and he continues in the process of reshaping their thinking. He essentially now, he shifts their paradigm for, for what it means to be great. In chapter 8, as we looked at previously, when Jesus first spoke of his his oncoming, his impending suffering, he told them whoever would lose his life or whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now, in a similar context, Jesus will present his disciples with yet another kingdom paradox. If you want to be great, if you want to be first, then make yourself last even to the point that you become a servant of all. You see, Jesus is ushering in a new way of thinking, a new value system established in kingdom priorities. This is entirely upside down from everything that the culture of that time valued and esteemed as important. And it is entirely upside down from everything that our culture values and esteems to this day. Jesus is now offering a whole new set of definitions whereby we understand what it means to be great. And at the very heart of it, at the core of it, is this call to serve. I think this is just an incredible picture of transformation. I think it shows us something about discipleship. It's about, it's about adopting a new set of definitions. It's about seeing things through this, this paradoxical set of lenses that Jesus is now describing to his disciples. I believe this is what the book of Romans is describing when it says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, their values, their way of thinking, their definition of what it means to be great. But be transformed, adopt a new way of thinking by the renewing of your mind. Jesus is showing us something. He's modeling something here about what it means to be discipled, what transformation looks like, to adopt a new way of thinking. If you want to be first, says Jesus, make yourself last by becoming a servant of all. Jesus' description of these kingdom values is now punctuated with a new perspective. A new perspective. This argument among the disciples about who would be the greatest among them has now been turned by Jesus into a teaching on what it means to serve selflessly. In verse 36 and 37, it says, And he took a child 
and he put him in their midst. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. I think, I think Jesus is doing two very important things here. First, I think he is revealing to us something of the nature or the degree to which this teaching applies. To point to a child as the recipient of their service was, was significant. This culture had no sort of idealized notions of, of children. They were essentially regarded as insignificant. Just this week at the, at the GLS, the, the Global Leadership Summit that we hosted here at our church, there was a pastor from Africa that was talking about how Jesus crushes the power gaps. And, and he was talking about how throughout that, that culture, whether it was in status and position or it was between men and women or, or, or adults and children, Jesus would come into these power gaps and crush them and, and place people in equal value. He said the same exists in many ways in his own culture in, in Africa, and it's the continued work of the church there. Jesus points to a child, a child who in that culture held no power, no status, no, no rights, uh, except that which was given them by their father. They were vulnerable, entirely dependent, and subject to, to the complete authority of the patriarch of the family. Jesus now points the disciples to a child in order to demonstrate the extreme degree to which they were, to which, to which we are called to make ourselves last, to what it really looks like to be a servant of all. There is, I think, an ongoing conversation here that will need to be saved for another day, regarding the application of this passage or what this would look like in our own culture and society. If Jesus were standing on this stage and he was teaching us the very same thing, who would he point to and say, serve them? Who is that in our own culture and society and how effective are we as the church in serving those people? It would be an, an interesting conversation. I think there is also then here a second purpose and perhaps a greater point that Jesus is making with the inclusion of this child in the passage. In addition now to highlighting the degree to which this truth applies, Jesus, I think, is revealing something about our condition. You see, this is how we come to God. We are, the disciples were in that context, the child. In and of myself, apart from what Christ has done in me, I bring no credential. I have no power, no status, I have no right to claim before an almighty and holy God. I'm exposed. I'm vulnerable. I'm entirely dependent, and I am only able to look to the Father. Jesus directing us to a child is more than an illustration of how we are to serve others. It reveals our need. It reveals what God would do, what he has done for us in Christ. You see, we are that child. That is exactly our condition when Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. This truth, then, is both informs and empowers our call to serve. I mentioned at the outset of, of this sermon that if we fail to consider the who and if we fail to consider the why behind these transformative verbs, then we run the risk of building our own case of self-righteousness. I've, I've found myself there. I think that this exchange between Jesus here and his disciples not only shows us, not only enables us to see the who, but I think it shows us something also about the why. You see, what ultimately is our motivation to serve? Why do we do it? I think this passage shows us that it's the result of two gospel responses in our heart, in our life. It is both worship and it is witness. We worship by serving when our hearts are in full awareness that this is exactly what God has done for us. When I take in what Christ has done for me, when that truth penetrates my heart, I cannot help by responding to him in worship. 
And one of the ways that I worship is by showing, by modeling, by doing to others what he has done for me. I don't know if you think of it in these terms, but when you teach a a class of third grade boys downstairs, you worship. When you're here on a Wednesday night with a group of fifth and sixth grade students, you worship your God. When you carry a bag of groceries from the food pantry into someone's car, you are proclaiming worship to your God. When you care for a neighbor or a friend or a complete stranger who can't care for themselves, you are in the midst of undiluted worship of a God that has done the same for you. We serve as worship in response to what we know and have seen and understand that God has done for us. But we also serve as witness. We serve in order to create a tangible, touchable, visible expression of gospel truth. The greatest articulation that our world may ever hear from us with regards to the gospel may never come from our mouths, but rather from our hands and our feet. If I want my world to know what Jesus has done for them, then I will serve them. If I want my neighbor to know what Jesus has done for them, then I will serve them. If I want my family to know what Jesus has done for them, then I will serve them. I'm not advocating for what oftentimes gets referred to as as merely a social gospel. What I'm advocating here for is an active gospel that culminates in people knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Service is a means whereby we demonstrate to the community around them that there's a God and that he loves them, and that he's died on a cross for them, and that he invites them into relationship with them. Service is a bullhorn where we can shout to our community that a God loves you. If you think about Libby's story, talking about this summer where she got to play the role of Professor Pancake, you could see the joy on her face because she is living out this response, this understanding of what God has done for her into the lives of the children, and she is demonstrating for them who Jesus is and what he's done. And the story of that little girl responding is so powerful because it reminds us what it means to serve, and it reminds us what can happen when we do. God, through the gospel, has given us two responses. We serve as worship. We serve as witnesses. You think about this fall, and you think about, and we live busy lives with jam-packed schedules and a million different things going on. But my strong encouragement would be to find that place where you will worship your God by serving others. Whether it be in the confines of, of these walls in this church and children's ministries or, or other opportunities that we have to serve, find that place to worship Him that way, to point other people to Jesus as a witness of what he's done for them. And see the transformation, experience for yourself what unfolds in your own heart and your own lives. One of the greatest expressions or articulations of of exactly what I think Jesus is teaching here is found in Philippians chapter 2. And I intentionally didn't put this passage on the screen. I, I just want you to, I want you to receive these words this morning. To hear these and to soak this in. Philippians 2. It says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of the Father. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we recognize, we acknowledge this morning that we're only even capable to serve because you have first served us. And Lord, we just thank you for that. Our hearts respond in, in gratitude. But Lord, as we, as we serve others, let us do so as worship. Let us do so as a testimony to what you have done for them. And God, work out your transformation in our hearts and lives and in this, your church. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before I offer this morning's benediction, I just want to remind you, as we've been talking about serving a couple opportunities that we have here at the church. Um, one is, uh, as we prepare for our picnic on the 23rd, as a part of that, we are um, partnering with our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry. Um, there will be uh, volunteers and back servants who are passing out these bags um, with instructions if you'd be willing to take one and fill these up. On the 23rd, we're going to bring these back together to help restock the Illinois Food Pantry to continue and just an amazing, um, amazing service opportunity that we have here at the church. And then this is the 2015 Ministry Impact Story. This is full of examples of people serving and the work that God's doing in the hearts and lives of this church. Grab one of these on your way out. You'll be blessed by hearing um, how God is, is continuing to move in the hearts and the lives of the church. Would you stand with me and receive this morning's benediction? And now to him who made himself nothing, who took on the very nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that at his name every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.